paranormal Karen. She's so spooky. Paranormal Karen. Funny too. Paranormal Karen. She's so spooky. Oh, and did I mention she's funny too? Yeah. Cha cha cha. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Paranormal Karen. Uh, just some quick house cleaning. You want to uh, join the Patreon. Uh, we got extra episodes of Paranormal Karen. Uh, book a reading at KarenRontowski.com. And I am going to jump right in because we have such an interesting guest today. Uh, Dr. Gallagher is an MD board certified psychiatrist, is a uh, professor of psychiatry at New York Medical and a psychoanalyst on the faculty on Columbia University. He graduated from Princeton University, Phi Beta Kappa in classics in classics, uh, and trained as a resident in psychiatry at Yale University School of Medicine. Uh, he is the world's foremost scientific expert uh, in the subject of diabolical attacks. He has been an active member of the International Association of Exorcists since 1990. Uh, Dr. Gallagher, thank you for coming on the show. You have a new book out called Demonic Foes. And uh, it looks fascinating. I want to jump in and get started. So you weren't actually a paranormal exorcist type person when you started this, were you? Uh, first of all, Karen, thank you for the invitation. No, uh, I never really uh, got into this field uh Voluntarily, <laughs> I never, I never really volunteered for anything. Uh, it started when a uh, I had finished my residency at Yale and I was working at uh, Cornell Medical College, and there was a a priest exorcist, completely unknown to me, who came to my office, knocked on the door, and said, "Dr. Gallagher, um, you know, we have a kind of strange case that." we would appreciate if you would evaluate for us. And I kind of said to him, I had just been through, Karen, what what was known as the satanic panic, where there were people, <clears throat> you know, at that period in the uh, late last century who were seeing Satanists everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew very well that there were people who were claiming that Satanists were kidnapping kids um, and to the tune of 50,000 a year. And I also knew that there weren't 50,000 missing children in America, and, <laughs> and most of them were runaways. So, you know, I was kind of skeptical of a lot of this whole stuff. Uh, and so I said to the uh, priest respectfully, I said, uh, with, you know, I said, Father, you know, I'm a little skeptical of that sort of thing. And I, I always remembered what he said to me. He said with a smirk, well, then you're the perfect man for the job <laughs> because he wanted someone skeptical. And eventually he, he sent me this case. It was a woman who had come to see him uh, about from about 2000 miles away. She was a Hispanic American woman who claimed that she was being uh, beaten up by invisible spirits and her husband verified this. I mean, I, I needed to make sure she wasn't abused or anything like that. She had bruises all over her body. We did some testing, including what they call, uh, you know, clotting disorders. Uh, you know, I want to know if her platelets were low with all these bruises appearing. And I could, I could not really find any psychiatric or medical explanation to... Um, uh, discount her theory, which was verified by uh, quite a few people who would actually see this happening. And so I said to the priest, well, um, look, Father, uh, there really is no obvious medical or psychiatric explanation here. And he said to me, um, well, Dr. Gallagher, that's what we thought. This woman is not possessed, but, you know, she is what we call oppressed by spirits. And uh, after that, Karen, it was really off to the races in the sense that uh, he and his colleague, who were among the few exorcists in America at the time, uh, so they would see cases all over the country. They would solicit my opinion and show me these cases. Sometimes I would travel with them. And so I developed very quickly a tremendous um, experience in this field, learned a lot, especially in the first few years. 
And ever since everything as well that I've been asked to do, uh, you know, I was asked to join the International Association of Exorcists. Obviously, I'm not an exorcist. It was as a scientific advisor. I was later asked to write an article for the Washington Post, which interestingly suggested I talk of my experience as a psychiatrist, but not pr- provide any evidence. So people people understandably ask for evidence. So that's when that's when I decided to uh, write the book Demonic Foes, which I was delighted Harper Collins published uh, relatively recently, where I could really treat this complex subject at depth and provide a lot of evidence. I, you know, uh, I loved it uh, when I, I loved when I saw who you were because a lot of people and because I do work in the paranormal field and I do work with, I kind of, a lot of uh, people that are very careful. I was brought in under someone under his wing that is very careful because I think a lot of people rush into this paranormal world and don't understand how dangerous it is. And I know uh, Father Bishop Long also always insists on a psychiatric counseling before to make sure that there's no... uh, uh, you know, that that it is an exorcism and not just a person uh, that might need attention or, like you said, who is being hurt at home anyways. Um, we're, now, I've read the first review of some of your book, and you have seen some, before we get to some of the crazy things you've seen, do you go into the causes of why a person might become possessed? Have you, uh, have you talked about that? Like, is it, it's funny you managed to say tannic panic. I just heard that same phrase a couple of days ago. Um, it's actually being in a satanic cult is probably a rare amount of people you would see. Wouldn't you say? People in satanic cults, uh, that is very rare. I mean, it, it's not non-existent, and I write in the book about a uh, very uh, prominent member of a cult who got possessed. Um, but it is rare. Possessions themselves are rare. Uh, what we call oppressions, which are more minor attacks, are a little more common, but they're still rare. Yeah, it's my job to help, uh, you know, people in the church. I am a Catholic uh, on this on this Good Friday when we're taping it. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, you know, the church is very rigorous about its diagnoses, and you really have to rule out uh, medical and psychiatric problems or people who are just suggestible, this sort of thing. So we, we, we help serve the uh, exorcists uh, to uh, make sure that they're not dealing with someone with uh, psychiatric or medical problems. Now, most, most sensible exorcists you know, are able to kind of discern a lot of that themselves. I mean, you know, I always tell people if a person levitates or all of a sudden starts speaking foreign languages, including fluent Latin, that's obviously not somebody who's mentally ill. (laughs) Right. Um, Interesting people ask me, how rare is this? Uh, You know, I'm a very experienced clinical psychiatrist. I used to run the uh, crisis and emergency services for my county here on the East Coast. And I've evaluated as patients, again, um, I've evaluated about 27,000 people um, during the course of my long and long and longer career all the time. And none of those patients were possessed. So I'm not seeing, you know, possessions in your average patient. I'm seeing them in people who usually are referred to me by clergy. But now that I've developed a little bit of a reputation, although I can't see them all, people who have sort of come out of the woodwork and already suspect they have um, something demonic. But these are not patients of mine. These are just patient people I consult, and consult with. Uh, and, and you're right to imply that uh, getting involved with this field, and that's why I don't really recommend that too many people volunteer for it, it can be dangerous. I have a good friend who does this sort of work, and he deals with a lot of paranormal investigators from Hollywood and stuff. And, and he, uh, he, he tells me that a lot, a, uh, some, some bad things happen to some of those people. So it's, it's a field to be cautious about. Yeah. You don't want to uh, jump in and not know what you're doing. Um, 
in fact, do you find there's a um, pattern to the type of person that becomes possessed? Because I'm sure there's like the uh, person that maybe was fooling around with a Ouija board or there's always the mistakes like people that sort of know. But for just a regular, uh, say the, the little Hispanic woman that came to you, was she just going about her day? How do you find any uh, common denominator between people that end up getting possessed? Well, again, remember that woman wasn't possessed. I mean, there, there, was, yeah. there was a different story there. The people who get possessed, and again, um, you know, I'm a I'm a psychiatrist. I mean, the the other reason I went into this field was simply because, um, as you probably well know, Karen. People who are possessed are suffering people. I mean, and, you know, I sort of went into this field to, as a physician to help suffering, tormented people. And these are these are some of the um, most uh, tormented people in the world. So um, I'm not I'm certainly not judging them is what I'm saying, right. uh, you know, as a doctor. Having said that, in general, they have somehow wittingly or or unwittingly invited the spirit in so it's this is not something that's all of a sudden going to happen to somebody you know as i said i don't have a patient come into my office and say oh by the way sir uh you happen to be possessed you know that doesn't happen it's it's people who have often got involved in something a little um a little dicey Mm -hmm. now they may they may have turned to evil uh, like this, like this Satanist woman I just mentioned. Um, I've also draw, uh, dealt with a number of criminals who have gotten themselves possessed. The other major way of inviting it in is through being heavily involved in kind of the dark side of the occult, mm. um, getting involved in, um, you know, black magic, getting involved with dark arts, stuff like that, uh, which has traditionally been called uh, sort of dark arts. Um, and that's that's where people do get in trouble. Now, you mentioned a Ouija board. Yeah, uh, look, I, I, I think there are, you know, teenagers who play with a Ouija board and, you know, it's just sort of a, a silly game. But there are people who take that very, very seriously. And what it, what what they're doing is seriously trying to commune commune with spirits and unfortunately they are often communing with spirits that they um that lie uh, yeah that lie and that, that have no conception of that the person has no conception of who they're really dealing with because because they lie they pretend they're they're deceased souls that sort of thing so, for instance, in the in the case upon which the Exorcist movie was based, it was it was not this uh, girl Reagan in the movie, which was fictionalized, but it was based on a uh, teenage boy in Maryland who had a spiritualist aunt, and she had died. He was very close to her, and he was attempting to seriously communicate with her through the Ouija board. All of a sudden, all kinds of weird things happened to him. Uh, He was evaluated by his local minister. 50 people observed all kinds of weird things that surrounded him, and he wound up possessed. Eventually, uh, about a year later, after um, turning to the Catholic Church, he was... uh, he, he had a dramatic possession, and but he was exercised by the Jesuits in St. Louis. And that was Father Malachi Martin, right? No, no, no. Ma- Martin wasn't involved in that oh, case. Okay. I, I, I met Martin a few times. He was uh, a very erudite, uh, sort of charming Irishman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he actually was not quite as prominent in the field as he implied. There may have been a little bit of exaggeration in his book. Although I think it's very hard to know. I, I never got a chance to ask him about it. He he was more like assisting exorcisms than an exorcist himself. Uh, he kind of emphasized the melodrama between uh, the priest and the, you know, demon. Uh, I think he I think he exaggerated that for effect because, you know, any good exorcist is going to say that 
the battle is not really between the exorcist and the demon. The exorcist, all sensible exorcists that I've ever met, had said, have said to me, you know, Rich, it's not, it's not myself who battles the demon. It's I pray for our Lord's prayers, and it's God or our Lord who delivers the person. So I think there was a little Irish exaggeration in that book, but I don't mean to accuse him of anything. Uh, sure. It, it, it is a fascinating book. Um, so the Catholic Church has put, really is on the forefront of exorcism. They have just put years and years, I, I would think, maybe I'm wrong, more so than any other religion, um, sort of research and time into exorcism. They seem to be uh, the leading in that field. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I try to take a, a, a balanced scholarly perspective, and there are there are Protestant deliverance ministers who do a good job in the Orthodox tr- tradition, uh, also the Orthodox Christians, um, actually have prayers of exorcism that go back even further than the uh, Catholic uh, Roman ritual. But it is true that uh, Catholics, um, certainly in the Western world, see m- most of the most serious cases, I would say, and they have a long tradition. They have a long tradition about being careful, too. You know, it's nothing... Nothing recent, even in the ritual, which was from the 1600s, they they caution not to jump to the conclusion of a demonic attack. Number one, uh, they get, they advise that it takes very strict criteria to be able to discern that that the priest should not jump to that conclusion or be overly credulous, and that in 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 need of consultation, if there's a confusing case. Uh, the manual, which is still in use, by the way, uh, updated, but still in use. The manual actually uh, stipulates that a physician should be brought in. Yes. Have you had any health problems? Um, I know that's a weird question, but uh, so I working... I have not worked on an exorcist case. I have no interest. I will listen to your stories from here and that will be enough for me. Um, but I work with some people that have, that have also worked with the church. And there were a couple of, uh, pretty, um, high profile in the paranormal world, priests or, uh, uh, they were sort of participating in the world. So I want to make that clear, but, but they really did their job. They did exorcisms and they all seem to get die of sort of digestive issues, uh, from being around, I think this, shall I say this frequency for a while, have you or any of the, uh, people you work with had health issues from doing this? Well, I, I think I do know people in the field who have been sort of have had some attack upon themselves. That's true. I mean, you shouldn't go into this field uh, unless, first of all, you protect yourself spiritually by spiritual practices. In my case, I also have a lot of people um, praying for me. So, um, again, I'm not an exorcist. I think that... Uh, uh, the real enemy of these individuals, of these demonic entities, is the exorcist, not the advising doctor. Uh, but having said that, I think anybody involved in this field should protect themselves, and I do. And, and hold that thought. We're going to go on a break, and I want to hear how you protect yourself. Okay, hold on, everybody. We'll be right back. Hey, you. Yes, you. Are you looking for a new podcast that appeals to your scientific curiosity, but is also a little bit spooky? Show me how I died in a past life. Well, look no further, because this cat is where it's at. He had concerns about the ethics surrounding AI, feeling they had achieved consciousness. Curious Cat Podcast examines the shadowy space where science and the supernatural collide. Listen every week with your host, Jennifer Holtz, as she and her guests explore what it means to be a soul in a meat suit. We were healing karma together. They were all kind of predestined to, to resolve something. Listen on all your favorite streaming apps and continue the conversation on Twitter 
at CuriousCatPodCA, or find Jennifer and all her links at Jennifer L. Hotes, spelled H O T E S dot com. Okay, I uh, I love uh, you have people pray for you. I love um, you probably have a religious uh, practice that you uh, do. What would that be, or could is that too private? Could you describe that to us, Doctor Gallagher? Well, there's nothing really remarkable about it. I'm a, I'm a I'm a practicing Catholic, and uh, you know I I pray every day. I frequent the sacraments, so. Nothing, nothing really all that out of the ordinary. I don't profess to be, I've never professed to be any kind of paragon, but I try to keep up a normal, you know, prayer and spiritual life. I, I think it's foolish to be involved in this field if you don't have a healthy spirituality. Yes, I feel like sometimes I watch paranormal investigators go in as though they are uh, in uh infallible or uh you know uh as if they are bigger they take it on they challenge it and i want nothing to do with that um so you were talking about how sometimes someone let's say that leads a darker life say they are a criminal say they don't have a conscious although i would say probably a sociopath would not be possessed would they would they would a would a demon have access to someone who was a sociopath well i would say that that type of person you know if they're doing evil acts in their life might be susceptible to a possession but no sociopathy in itself is not automatically uh, mean that someone is possessed what what i do karen is uh you know, and I, I go over this in the book in, qu- in quite some depth. I try to identify all the major medical and psychiatric illnesses that confuse people. Some people, yes, say, well, people with severe, dark, destructive feelings of, say, different types of personality disorders, including antisocial, um, may be possessed. But that that's that's not true. I mean, the vast, vast majority, even of even of evil people, we don't automatically say they're possessed. Sometimes people who are psychotic for different reasons, schizophrenics, for instance, imagine they're possessed because they hear hallucinations of demons, but it might as well be the FBI or aliens or communists or something, Mm -hmm. that those conditions are often responsive pretty well, at least to, to a degree, to medications. They're not possessed. Um, in more recent decades, people have said, well, aren't most of these cases sort of multiple personality, what we call dissociative identity disorder? And I've seen over 100 cases of multiple personality in my life. They're nothing like possession, in part because all these conditions, including neurological ones that sometimes are confused with demonic attacks, they, they lack the paranormal features. Um, we ourselves prefer the term preternatural, meaning beyond beyond nature. A lot of what's called in the modern world the paranormal, which is a modern term, essentially are attempting to describe what in the past used to be regarded as spiritual, either supernatural uh, or, in the case of a lot of phenomena, diabolic. And that's what we call the preternatural. And to diagnose a possession you have to have clear evidence not only of the history that there's some reason this person got attacked because as i said it doesn't just come out of the blue but you have to have a number of paranormal features Uh, the classic ones are enormous strength or bizarre movements um, that are humanly impossible speaking a foreign language that the person never knew i'm not just talking about mumbling a few, you know, mm-hmm. phrases, phrases uh, that the person has picked up in their life. Uh, and also what, what is called in Latin, it's by the term latro, which means that the, the, the person, really the demon, has access to hidden knowledge that the person wouldn't know. These are some of the classic signs. And without those clear signs of something preternatural, 
as well as a um, suggestive history, uh, you don't have firm grounds for diagnosing a possession. So it's, it's very different than a medical or psychiatric illness. Does the person always somewhere uh, have a contract or an agreement that this is going to happen? Well, I would put it a little. I would put it a little differently. I, I would say, uh, as I said earlier, wittingly or unwittingly, they have invited the demon in. The, the, the demons are very legalistic, and so if you ask them for a favor, even like communing with a dark spirit, um, they feel they have legal rights over you. It's a little bit like dealing with uh, the mafia. You know, um, when you're dealing with organized crime. If they do you a favor, they feel they own you. And it's very, very hard to get out of that sort of relationship with uh, an organized criminal. Um, You're really, in some ways, talking about cosmic criminals or terrorists. They have a very traditional view of the demonic world. Mm. And once, once you have, in some way, maybe not even fully aware, invited it in, uh, they don't want to let go. They feel they have rights to you. Now, there are, there are some clear cases where people have literally worshipped Satan, like the woman I write about in the book who was a Satanist, and they have committed themselves to Satan in a very explicit way or made what is traditionally called sort of a literal Faustian bargain. And those people um, put themselves in tremendous danger of being possessed but those individuals are rare. It's more that a person has opened themselves up to something dark. I write about a guy in a in in the book who I call Juan. All the people, all the people's names in the book are pseudonyms, but every every fact in the book is literally true. I've just changed their names, and generally they've given me permission to write about them. Um, Juan had turned to a Mexican dark cult called Santa Santa Muerte. Well, uh, it's sort of similar to Santa Maria, but it's called Santa Muerte. It means sort of holy death. And it's a, it's a similar type of dark uh, uh, Hispanic cult. And it, it's, it's a type of Satanism, I guess you could say, although I'm not sure that they would agree with that. Um, uh, like Santa Maria, who often present themselves as, you know, sort of good practitioners but uh he he claimed that his turning to the cult allowed him to be a successful criminal and he said i could have all the women and all the cars i ever wanted i was on top of the world until he wasn't and he got arrested and he was uh, put in prison and the prison chaplain properly discerned that he was possessed now eventually he did turn back to the church he was brought up catholic and he worked on um, getting himself liberated, and, and he was liberated from his possession, as opposed, say, to the Satanist woman. In the book, I call her Julia. I have a long chapter on her. She's probably the most um, flamboyant case I've ever seen, um, according to the, the two exorcists with whom I originally worked, who were trying to help her. Um, they described her as a once in a century case. I have a whole chapter about her. And she never, she knew she was possessed and she wanted to get rid of the possession. But unfortunately, out of both fear and for what she got out of the cult, she had a lot of psychic abilities, uh, which she clearly ascribed to Satan, by the way. I mean, she didn't think she was gifted or something. She she once said to me, nobody's gifted. Uh, they either get it from above or from below. Hmm. But unfortunately, um, she had also had a relationship with the leader of the cult. For a lot of reasons, she didn't really want to leave the cult. She just wanted to be relieved of her possession. Uh, there's a good English phrase for that. You want to have your cake and eat it too. Yes, I was just going to say, I don't think you can do that, can you? And so you can't do that. So that's a contradiction in terms. You know, I sometimes have to instruct people that exorcism is not magic. First of all, again, it's not the it's not the exorcist himself who 
delivers the person. It's God, and God decides, you know, it's not like something God wants, but God allows humans and, and, and demons to have a lot of freedom, so it's sometimes it's freedom to do horrible things like a Hitler type. Um, it's not something God wants, but he allows for his own mysterious purposes. But he ultimately is also God or Lord, you know, we would say Jesus in, in the Christian tradition um, is the one who delivers people. And uh, But they have to work at it. You know, it, it's, it's not magic prayers. They have to renounce their past misdeeds and, and turn to God for help. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, so basically a good, uh, shall, we, shall we say, prescription for this is to be good with God and try to do good, try to be a good person. Um, you know, I think randomly, <laughs> sometimes I just ask for forgiveness and uh, sometimes I'll say for things I don't even know if they were wrong, <laughs> like to just kind of be like, uh, I think that's a, that's a, just in general as human beings. Um, the lady that you were talking about, was that the woman that came into the church and started throwing people around? No, that was another woman. Uh, that was a woman, um, in the, in the book I call her Barbara. Now she had been involved in a cult when she was a teenager. She sort of left the cult but she later felt that um, she had been um, given, so to speak, by the cult, a, a demonic spirit. And uh, it surfaced when she was a little older. Um, she had been brought up Lutheran. And she went to a Lutheran deacon who uh, was very inexperienced. I mean, this is not a field for the faint-hearted. Uh, he thought he could sort of say some prayers with her in a church hall and everything might be hunky-dory. Well, he got he got in for a big surprise because when the demon manifested itself, again, it's not like the demon is manifesting 24-7. They, they're, they're in the body. They cannot take over the, the free will or the soul of the person but they're 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 possessing the body but a lot of times they're lying low and sometimes they're accessed primarily by by say an exorcism so this guy was in over his head he started to say the prayers the demon manifested he wasn't being held down you have to be a little cautious in these cases and take the proper precautions and uh, the woman who at that point was manifesting lunged at him. Uh, she was about 90 pounds soaking wet. I knew I, I came to know her very well. And um, she took this 200 pound deacon and threw him clear across a big church hall, injuring him. Uh, you, can, you can bet that that ended that session. Eventually, she turned to a Catholic priest and, and you know, got help from, from the church. Uh, did the Satanist that wanted to stay in the cult, did she end up getting clean or did she disappear or how did that turn out? Yeah, it's a long story. I often tell the story of when I first uh, met her, uh, the, the person I call Father Jacques, who was a famous American exorcist. That's not his real name, but he's deceased now and I don't feel I had his permission to use his real name. But he told me that he wanted me to meet this Satanist woman, but I hadn't met her yet. And my wife and I were up in our uh, bedroom at about three o'clock in the morning. Um, our cats went berserk and we couldn't understand it. You know, they were relatively well-behaved cats. We had to separate them and, we, you know, we didn't think too much of it. Maybe they had catnip or something bad to eat or something. It was a little... It was a little mysterious, but we chalked it up to some something odd. Unbeknownst to me, the priest, uh, who was very eager for this woman to get help, brought this woman to my house the next day. Uh, I was kind of annoyed about that. I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, said, I said, Father, with all due respect, please do not bring Satanists to my neighborhood, okay? We'll meet in the um, park, yes. <laughs> but the first thing she said when she met me is she said, 
nice to meet you, Dr. Gallagher. Uh, by the way, how did you like those cats last night? Um, so that was a little spooky and, and, mm -hmm. and challenging how I first met her. She had all kinds of psychic abilities. She had what the parapsychologists call remote viewing. She could see people at a distance. And she boasted of that. It was one of the reasons why she um, um, why she wanted to remain a member of the cult, and because she felt that Satan, as I said, uh, I always remember her to repeat myself. Uh, she said, "People aren't gifted; they they get their gifts from somewhere else. They get it from either above or below." And she was quite clear that she got her psychic abilities from uh, Satan. Uh, she had very dramatic exorcisms. The, the uh, priests were trying to weaken the demon's hold on her uh, during the last one, which I did not, which I did not see. I um, mean, I'm a, you know, I was a pretty busy family man, still a busy doctor, and um, you know, about eight people told me she levitated for about half an hour during the exorcism. She spoke all kinds of foreign languages. She and she ultimately, however. Um, despite a series of a few exorcisms, was never delivered precisely for the reasons we talked about earlier, that she never agreed to leave, leave the cult and renounce her ways. It was a sad, tragic case. <clears throat> After uh, stopping uh, the exorcisms, uh, she later... Uh, I later spoke to her and she said she wanted to resume, she wanted to resume it because she was dying and the priest wanted me to speak to her oncologist. Um, and she kind of hemmed and hawed, uh, not exactly sure what was going on in her head at the time. Uh, but she said she was dying and that, um, you know, this was her last chance, but she didn't really cooperate again. And we just assumed because we, we and the priest never heard from her again that she died. Huh? I wonder where she is now. That's a that's an interesting uh, quandary. Um, I kind of find that interesting when she says uh, you either get your abilities from above or below. I like at least above was included in that because I know a lot of psychics listen to this. Do you feel like because I always felt like even, you know, really great yogis can levitate uh, without being possessed, or this would be my opinion. And the same, I, I think humans are built to have psychic ability. Do you agree with that? Or no, you think it really is a gifted person? I always felt funny using the word gift. I always felt like I think everyone can do it. So I think gift separates us from other. Do you have any opinion on that? Well, um, yes, I do. And I'm not sure that I agree with a lot of uh, psychics and fortune tellers and that sort of thing. I, I do think that they're getting their gifts from somewhere else. Uh, you know, there have been holy people, as you say, uh, even great saints in the Catholic Church who have levitated. They're always a little careful themselves to say, well, I'm not sure where I'm getting this. Um you know, but I, I'm not denying that there aren't spiritually gifted person. I, I feel that the exorcist I work with, he could discern when this woman who I who I called Julia was around, and he he had some spiritual gifts. So there are spiritually gifted people. I think it's rare. Um, when I say gifts, I mean that they they are getting some kind of uh, ability. Uh, ultimately from God um, uh, to, to have certain spiritual powers. I, I do think those people are rare. I think it's more common that people, without knowing it, uh, draw on darker powers. Um, do you think, uh, I'm, you know what, hold on a second. I'm going to take a break and come back with this question because it seems like it's a big one. So hold on, folks. We'll be right back. <laughs> Many people are unaware just how much hypnotherapy can help them or think it's only to help lose weight or quit smoking. But there is so much more hypnotherapy can do. It can help with stress, anxiety, insomnia, phobias, performance enhancement, connecting with your spirit guides and higher self. You can even discover past lives and your life between lives. Heal traumas, 
break habits, find your deepest truth, or just have fun discovering who you really are, all from the comfort of your home. I'm Monique Pliakis. I'm a certified hypnotherapist, and I want to help you. Schedule a free consult by going to www.innerstandingshypnosis.com. That's I-N-N-E-R-S-T-A-N-D-I-N-G-S-H-Y-P-N-O-S-I-S.com. Understanding hypnosis. Find your power and ignite your inner light. Okay. Um. So when someone is possessed, the there's sort of a, a, maybe an easy or a hard way to describe it is there's then two beings in the body. There's the person who it is their body, and then there is a, a demonic attachment or something inside. Are they are aware of each other? Is that true? <laughs> Well, the the demon is certainly aware of what it's doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the evil spirit knows darn well that uh, it's inhabiting and torturing the person. Uh, these entities are fairly sadistic, so um, you know, sort of like a sadistic sociopathic person. Uh, so they make no bones about the fact that they have some rights over this this person in a crazy way. Uh, Now, the individual um, may or may not be fully aware of that. There there are what we call the different types of possessions. There there are sometimes what what they call lucid possessions, where the individual is very aware of what's happening, uh, even the demon acting. In the more severe cases, a lot of times, at least during what is called the crisis period, the demon will be able to put the person into a trance. That's what usually happens in an exorcism, where the priest will um, uh, start to say the prayers, and the the demon will be forced to manifest while the individual generally remembers nothing of what happens during the exorcism. Again, there are a few exceptions. Um, so, uh, the person has either a great degree or more minor degrees of awareness as what, what is going on, but they're, they're, they're fairly tortured individuals. They, they at least know their possessed usually. And, and in general, probably in life, they've probably had a bunch of traumas that kind of stuck to them and they might uh is that when you say a troubled person anyways it might might be going that way anyways they just i find it interesting when you were talking about the person that was brought up in a cult because i always feel like i had a friend who had a sister who at one point in high school um got involved must have they don't really know what happened she either got involved with some dark magic or something wasn't that kind of person at all and literally until the day she died she was pretty much possessed something happened there there was no help and exactly the things you're describing her speaking in tongues uh starting fires in the house when she wasn't you know uh not doing them like you and i would do them which i know you and i wouldn't set a house on fire but all kinds of things. And this person was really tortured probably for 40 years. But the the sister, it was almost like they wanted to say they never saw the sister again. Like this thing took over and it was all the time. Does that make sense? Have you seen anything like that? I, I'm, I know I'm putting three questions here at once, but I feel like that you can, having someone assigned to you, like the person you said that was brought up in the cult, that makes me very sad that like other people could assign something to you and have it take over and possess you. Did I, did I make any sense with that question? Well, you, you, you raise a lot of good issues. Some of which are, are, are complex. Again, I don't think as opposed to some subcultures in today's, world, you know, I don't think that there are these satanic cults all over the place. I think they're rare. Um, Number two, I do think that um, one has to be careful when one talks about being traumatized. Um, And there are people who have false memories of these cults, too. I mean, to complicate things even further. When people are traumatized, I mean, I, when I was at Cornell, I, I wrote a paper on trauma, did research on abuse and trauma. 
I mean, there are there are literally millions of people in our country who have been abused and traumatized. Uh, very few of those people ever get possessed or something. Right. What, right. what happens with people who are traumatized is often they become very bitter and unforgiving of perhaps understandably in some ways of their um, abuse. And it's, it's really always something spiritual that is inviting the demon in. In other words, people don't, people don't get possessed just because they've had psychological problems in their lives. Uh, They get possessed because something more than that is going on spiritually. Uh, Now there are, again, there are genuine victims, people who have, um, you know, been in environments where terrible had, things happened. Yes. Yes. Um, but again, that it's not like that. That stuff is co- is common. Uh, is there uh, more? Is there a? I kind of want to say a lesser level. You probably don't deal with this as much, but sometimes I think there's a lesser level of darker spirit you can have around you that uh, I I guess in my field, sometimes we'll call it an attachment where it's really not demonic because I know I agree with you. I think real, I've only seen it once in my life and I'm kind of in this field where it was really like, holy crap. Um, but I do think we can, like someone once said to me, like perhaps a, a drug addict or alcoholic would all kind of just be connecting with a sort of darker force. Like, I don't want to say an, uh, an, an addiction demon, but are there like other forces that are lighter that don't lead to possession uh, that you're aware of that you see in maybe clients at a much lesser level? Well, there are certainly lesser attacks. I mean, the traditional terminology is complex. It differs from culture to culture. It even differs from church to churches to denominations. Uh, we, we we tend to use a traditional characterization. There's possession, which is where the demon has taken over the 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 body and often the consciousness, or at least intermittently, of the person. Then there are a, a bunch of lesser attacks. I call them oppressions mm. that, that may be internal, where they uh, take over sort of the imagination and the um, uh, senses, or they can be, as in the case of the first woman I mentioned, they can be physically attacked. Uh, and they, they may even be a decent person and be physically attacked. Um, those those cases are a lesser type of demonic attack. And then there's what we call infestations. Infestations are where dark forces are affecting a house or a locale or something. Um, I do think that pretty much all those uh, phenomena are, are caused by demons. Now, there are people who um, you know, feel that there could be deceased humans or something who are causing problems. I always, I always uh, come back to a story of a woman who, in the book I call Sarah. She originally came to me, um, and she was a very um, nice woman, and uh, she claimed that angels were appearing to her, and she was skeptical of that because she thought she was unworthy of that. And I, I put her in touch with a priest to help her discern this. Uh, she had already been ruled out as schizophrenic or anything like that. Um, and then she came back later to me and she said, um, you know, Dr. Gallagher, you're right. These are not angels. Um, they tell me they're deceased souls. And I was still a little leery about deceased souls. Mediumship, now, yeah. yeah. Now tormenting her in that way. And I said, well, continue to pray about it, get the help of the priest. And about a month or two later, she came back to me for the final time. And she said, "Uh, again, Dr. Gallagher, I think I think you were trying to get me to see this. These demons, have these um, spirits attacking me have finally revealed that they are um, demons. What will happen is sort of analogous to what happens in a lot of um, um, exorcisms and possessions. I had a guy, for instance, who came to my office once, and he claimed to be possessed. He was possessed, and he claimed that um, it was some dead people um, 
in, in Jewish folklore, they used the word Dibix. Uh, it was uh, some dead people were possessing him, as well as, uh, hold on, as well as Zeus. And, um, you know, he was kind of a neo-pagan. Uh, he, he asked if I wanted to speak to Zeus. Uh, and this was a kind of lucid possession that I mentioned. Uh, I, de- I declined. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't speak to these demons. Um, and eventually uh, he had an exorcism. And the demons at that point had to admit that they were demons, that they were not dead souls, they were not uh, pagan deities. Uh, you know, throughout history, demons have tried to disguise themselves uh, as either deceased people, uh, Judas Iscariot or Uncle Jimmy or something. Uh, they've also attempted to, dis- to disguise themselves as pagan deities. Uh, the, the ancient... Uh, uh, Hebrews uh, became aware, and this is one of the reasons they were often so hostile to pagan cultures, because they felt the pagans were unwittingly uh, worshipping demons. Um, so uh, what I would say is that when these dark things happen, you have to kind of presume that it's probably demons often disguising themselves as as something else until, in fact, during exorcism, they are forced to reveal who they are. Uh, and after hiding for millennia, uh, they're, they're very reluctant to admit who they really are. But that's that's what they're compelled to do under the uh, uh, prayers of the exorcism. But do you believe we do have angels or guides that do speak to us? But it would be, obviously, it would be positive, not <laughs> negative. Well, I'm not sure I would use the word gods. I, I do, again, I do I do think things tend to be either preternatural or supernatural. And, uh, you know, as a Catholic, yes, I believe in guardian angels, you know. Yeah. I mean, what, what we believe traditionally, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, Karen, is in the Catholic Church, we believe demons are, are fallen angels yeah. uh, who have rebelled against God. And it shows that uh, I mean, it was an unwise choice, put it that way. But, uh, you know, it, it, in our opinion, it shows, as with human beings, that we are free and that God allows us to reject them. God doesn't force himself on to people. I mean, that's really what the teachings about the afterlife are. If you if you reject God, God doesn't force himself on, on the person and you know, people wind up some other place. Yes, it's interesting that you uh, described the woman that she felt she was unworthy to hear from angels because one of my, the most, there's a gentleman, he's a reverend now, but he had a negative near-death experience. And um, he said he really was, it sounded like he was on his way to hell, the what was being described. And he said he was an atheist and he said i just said a prayer and he said i don't even know if i said the pledge allegiance or a prayer but a light opened up and i started to go obviously this was god lifting him out of what was hell and as he got closer to the light he thought oh i don't deserve this and the light got smaller and he started to go back down and it was almost like unworthy was he had to know he was worthy of God's love. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm always, it's not that I totally disbelieve, but you have to be also skeptical of near-death experiences. Hmm. Um, That in itself could be, you know, either some kind of, in in a few cases, uh, neurological um, hallucinations, but it also could be some kind of trick. I'm not saying that I discount all those stories, but some of the stories are pretty banal and weird, and it's 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 hard to give them too much credibility. Uh, there there are plenty of you know people who do. I'm, I'm a little more skeptical of the the truthfulness of some of those experiences, but you know people have very powerful experiences. The problem with pow- powerful experiences is like people who take hallucinogens and think they, you know, sort of have found the mysteries of the universe or people who, who 
go on astral projection, that sort of thing. I'm sure you're aware people have had these odd spiritual journeys in their mind. Uh, I think I think people have to be very scared, uh, careful of all those things. I, I, I warn people against taking personal experiences too literally. The, the, the woman I mentioned is a very good example and because I give her credit for saying to me, you know, these angels are appearing to me. And what what she further said was that they have a special mission for me. And she was not a grandiose person, as some some people who get involved in these experiences are. And she said to me, um, look, I'm not a special person. I, I, I don't believe these are true angels. As opposed to, you got to remember, people throughout history, there have been many, many people who have seen visions who are not crazy, who are not what we would call psychotic. I mean, psychotic psychotic people can have visions too, but it, it's, it's a different type of experience. There are people who have had very coherent uh, visionary uh, uh, experiences who who think that they have these special revelations. This is how cults and new religions often start, mm. and one has to be very careful of those experiences, in my opinion. Uh, you, you can't base you can't base a religion just on one your individual your individual experience. I even say to people, if you permit me to to say something that's going to sound sure. pretty religious, that's okay. <laughs> um, excuse me. I uh, I wrote a book. I was challenged to present evidence. Uh, you know, I think I've seen more cases of possession than any physician in the world, probably more than any in history, uh, Karen. Because uh, you know, I I do see I do have spoken to a lot of people all over the world. I've been able to travel, and also um, uh, I've seen people on Zoom from different countries and stuff. So I have tremendous experience in this field, and I felt I should write a book to educate the public about this. Uh, also, because I, I can't see everybody. So, you know, I, I have to sort of get get the word out, you might say, by by writing a book. But I tell people, you know, you don't, you know, most people don't know me. I mean, you know, my friends would say I'm a very truthful person, but, you know, people don't know me. I say, you know, you don't have to believe me. Every two years, you mentioned that I belong to, as a non-exorcist advisor, the International Association of Exorcists, and I go to Italy, and we have this these meetings near Rome with about 500 exorcists, many of whom have published accounts of their own. So, you know, you can... And these people openly speak about very similar cases to what I've described in my book. So I said, you don't have to believe Dr. Gallagher, you know, just read the books of these 500 exorcists or try to speak to them. And and I make an analogy. um, If I could make a religious point. Uh, When St. Paul went to Corinth, now remember he claimed that the resurrected Jesus appeared to him. He went to Corinth, which is a little bit like maybe a a preacher from Kansas going to San Francisco or something. Mm -hmm. And he said to the Corinthians, who were a sophisticated group, uh, uh, often educated people, he said, look, you don't have to believe me. He said, there are 500 people who saw the resurrected Jesus. This is in the letter to the Corinthians. He said, you can talk to them. He said, most of them are still alive. So I, I bring it back to the point. Um, I have tried as a professor of psychiatry to write a very truthful book. Uh, there are always going to be some people who are skeptical of that. But I, I say to those people, they, this belief doesn't depend on the word of Dr. Gallagher. It, it, it's a testimony of, of literally thousands of people throughout history and any other 500 exorcists with whom I, I meet every two years in Italy could tell the exact same stories I, I, I'm I telling. You know, I mean, I, I write in the beginning of the book, you know, what is what is hidden in the dark, shout from the rooftops. You know, it's a phrase of Jesus. I mean, you know, we're trying to be very open about this. And I'm glad that, that more and more people are open about this subject because... I think that's the way you enlighten people. 
Yeah, I agree. And also, uh, you are welcome to say anything on my podcast. I hate to say it this way, but I, I'm <laughs> in general, I'm so against splitting the country. So I don't split people on my podcast. Nobody gets corrected. You're welcome to your views. Um, this also, when it happens, it doesn't happen overnight, right? It isn't something where someone is kind of doing bad things. And then all of a sudden they're possessed. There's sort of a, a time frame, more of a time frame there, isn't there? I think it varies from person to person. I think it can happen in, in, in some cases suddenly, but I think you're right that there's often, you know, minor signs that something is going on. Um, I mentioned the difference between oppression and possession. Often early on, you will see signs of some kind of oppressive phenomena or even even infestation phenomena where weird things happen in the houses of a person of a, the house of a person who is possessed but then eventually it does emerge so um more clearly so exactly when it starts it's sometimes hard to pin down but um i understand i understand the uh the thrust of your question i think that that does happen uh and and just my last uh so i remember walking down a street in Los Angeles and this is not uh, anything about home. There was a man that this is the only time I've ever done that where I literally stepped around the corner and hid from someone. And as he was coming up the sidewalk, uh, he looked worse than a homeless person. He was so thin and was almost walking on a broken ankle and the movements were not like someone having a seizure or anything like that. It, it was one of the most awful things I've ever seen. And I thought that is a person who has given up and something has taken over that body because you wouldn't be walking on this foot that looked like it was broken. Is that actually out there? Uh, would you say there are people like that out there? Not every day. Everyone's not seeing them every day. But I remember this person so clearly that I stepped behind a building. And I'm sure if it was a real possession, they could see me or find me. But I was like, I don't even want to make eye contact with that. Is that possibly out there? Or do I need a psychiatrist, Dr. Gallagher? Should I make an appointment with you? <laughs> well, I, th I think you had some kind of intuition. And it may have been you know, a very valid intuition. I mean, something weird was going on. I mean, I, I am committed to science, you know, uh, obviously as a physician, I have to be committed to science in my daily work. And, you know, I certainly believe in things like evolution and the big bang. Um, having said that, um, what I have to do as a physician, Karen is, is different than just intuition. Uh, I have met some intuitive people who are mistaken about things. Uh, I think you had a sense of, of this person that was probably valid uh, in, in my own work with the church. Uh, and I never speak for the church. I, I, I work with individual. I don't work in a team, by the way. I work with individual exorcists and, and victims. Uh, I, I am using pretty rigorous criteria. So, uh, with respect to your example, I'd obviously have to evaluate that individually, that individually. Before, <laughs> before I would know for sure. But I, I, I think probably you are picking up on something valid. Wonderful. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for being on the podcast. This was fascinating. Um, and thank you for the work you do. Um, well, I, somebody... well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful, op open minded interview. Uh, thank you. Yes, and I know someone has to do it, and it's not going to be me, so I appreciate your effort. Um, Demonic Foes is the name of the book. They can get it on, people can get it on Amazon and everywhere? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. It's actually selling pretty well. It's been already published in um, different countries, which show that even in non-Christian countries, there's a great interest in this sort of thing. Some people say to me, oh, well, how come the people are possessed? They're always fundamentalist Christians. I mean, nothing nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. I mean, people people in all cultures throughout all history have reported these rare cases. And, uh, you know, again, I wrote the book to educate the public. And 
about a tricky subject that I think there often are many misconceptions. I I think people, yes, I think it's the right book at the right time because people are so very curious. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gallagher. That uh, That seems great. I sure appreciate having you. You're very welcome. Okay, everybody, uh, we will see you next week. Thanks to Mike at Uno Rising Meeting. Everybody check out the Patreon, check out uh, my website, and we'll see you next week. Paranormal Karen.